Coming up today on Locked On Texas Tech, Red Raider football assistance, a story of straight cash, homie. And we also get to a stand-up comedy routine from the Pac-12 Conference and our guy, Patrick Mahomes, next on Locked On Texas Tech. You are Locked On Texas Tech, your daily podcast on the Texas Tech Red Raiders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're going to start this thing off right. Through Great to have you along for the ride once again on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks for making us your first listen each day on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. He's the only Chris Level. I'm Casey Cowan. And today's episode brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sports book of Locked On. So make every moment more with FanDuel by visiting FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Chris, great to be back with you once again, and man, great to be back on a day where we can kick off the show talking Red Raider football, and not just Red Raider football, but talking about something coming to fruition that uh, you've been touching on for quite some time now. It's probably been about a month maybe since we talked about uh, Texas Tech really making an effort to take care of coordinators and other wheels turning as far as taking care of Joey McGuire's staff. Uh, big picture wise and we've got some details now as to what that will look like and man it really looks like a splash to me among college football programs because I don't know if I've ever seen just such a a widespread kind of blanket um, bump uh, for a football staff well I I think it says a lot about Joey for one it says also a lot about about a, a Texas Tech and that you know kind of the, the, these are like next steps or like understanding okay we, we've got something pretty good here Let, let's let's take care of it but I think it also it, it's it's and this word gets thrown around a lot we talk about this word uh, a lot but I think for, for Joey this is the culture you know this is you know, wanting to make sure that this is a group that we're we're together we're we're you know growing together uh, this is the brand is that we've got stability um, and all those things. And, and if I think from a recruiting standpoint, it certainly um, uh, allows prospects to understand, you know, for the most part, these are the people that, that will be here and coaching uh, these young men and, and developing these guys and all those things. So because, you know, Cowan, you're, you're, you're now, I mean, your defensive coordinator now is averaging seven figures a year, you know, based on the, his, his average salary. I think it's like 1.1 million is what his average uh, would be uh, over that three year span. And I think Zach Kitley averaging 850 uh, a year over, over the, the, the contract. <clears throat> so, I mean, you, you've never paid coordinators this well. Uh, this is, this is again, a big step. And then you've got them locked in for multi-year agreements. So if anybody wants to come talk to them, you know, there, there's a buyout there, which, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't prohibit from somebody to, you know, just like Emma Jones had a buyout as well. It didn't stop Oklahoma from, from, from taking him away or, or talking to him or whatever, but, it, it, it does create a, a, a level playing field for you to keep your staff. And I think they're paying, be, being paid very competitive salaries, man. But, uh, but yeah, the coordinators and position coaches, but it doesn't even, you know, if you read the, the fine prints, I mean, this is Antonio Huffman, you know, kind of your ops guy. This is uh, your strength coach, you know? So, I mean, and we, we know about James Blanchard and, and like that support staff group. Uh, getting taken care of and they were the first uh, they were the head of the table uh, as yeah. far as uh, get, getting taken care of initially but yeah this is uh, I thought this was a pretty big deal yeah and it may just be a uh, timing but I think I mean James Blanchard was announced even before Joey McGuire's new deal right or any of this stuff I mean Blanchard was like at the top of the list yeah you and, and I think I think Joey would tell you that football people are important but in this in this day and age with NIL, with Portal, with all the stuff that, you know, not that they're more important, but they are every bit as important as like your top coaches, whoever those might be, yeah. whether it's a coordinator or otherwise, that your support guys and your strength guys are or, or people, okay, 
the, the, those are those are vital and those are ones that he really wants to to take care of because theoretically those are kind of the culture people you know those are kind of the people that are can be around more often than not they're not they're not going out on the road and going to recruit but they're they're deciding or developing who is who is in this program on a daily basis. And so anyway, I well, just that, think he, yeah, he sees the importance I, of those kinds. I was going to say you've identified before regarding like Blanchard, for example. Um, and you're talking about culture there and really having an impact on it from that position Blanchard um, and some others, you know, being those guys that are identifying the guys that may be a red Raider at some yep. point in time. And therein is where you're building your culture, obviously. So incredibly important 10 assistants, Two support staff personnel, so 12 in total get bumps. According to Texas Tech, a $798,000 salary pool increase uh, for those assistants. Around $7.5 million now invested in McGuire's second season. Texas Tech says this is the largest in program history. So if you haven't seen some of the numbers, like Chris was alluding to there, uh, Tim DeRuiter, Zach Kitley, three-year deals. DeRuiter, $3.15 million over those three years. Kitley, $2.55 million over those three years. And then, yeah, you could just run down the list. Uh, linebackers coach CJ IU, inside linebackers coach Josh Bookbinder, tight ends coach Josh Cochran, defensive line coach Zarnell Fitch, and O-line coach Stephen Hamby. In addition to Kenny Perry, Marcel Yates, defensive passing game coordinator, special teams coordinator, running backs coach, associate head coach. You guys can sort out all those titles. Uh, obviously, Chris mentioned as well, strength and conditioning coach Lance Barlow and Antonio Huffman, uh, the associate athletics director for football administration. So, in addition to Joey McGuire, Chris, and a new six-year, $26.6 million contract that he's gotten, you have now gone essentially across the board. And we know that that, that, that monetary increase signifies maybe the biggest in program history. But I'm curious, in your time around the program or even back, you know, just your days on campus, um, as long as you've been observing Texas Tech football, has there been anything to compare this to where you have – regardless of what the dollar amount actually looked like, but you've just gone kind of across the board and you're like, you, 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 you're going no. Oprah Winfrey. You get a new contract. You get a new contract. And I know that it's not totally across because we've got some change with the aforementioned Emmett Jones, but I, I don't remember anything like this really as far as just being so widespread. Yeah. And he, and he would have gotten uh, I think of a hefty raise as well. Had he, had he remained here, but no, that, because I always say, and I, and, I, and I would say this like with your basketball staff right now, I mean, odds are it won't come back the same next year as it is right now, okay? that That's just the way the sport goes. And football, you almost, you almost did that, and that is nearly unheard of. <laughs> whether, it, whether it's your choice or another coach's choice, whether it's a promotion, uh, hey, man, we, we, we got to do something different here. It's yeah. not – it's not – you, it's us, but we're we're moving on. What whatever the, the situation would be, um, but but this is this is a rarity because you know, it, and it always is kind of a just an eye opening experience when after a season ends, and in in late December, early January, whatever. Well, there's this gap of time between then and spring. And then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of be doing the basketball thing uh, with, with tech and everything. And then I'll go back over there for spring football and you get over there and you're like, who are these new 15 people? And it's not just, <laughs> right. yeah, it's not just coaches, but it's, it's all the, it's all the, the, the graduate assistants, the analysts, the, you know, student managers. I mean, there's just a lot of uh, people yeah. involved in these programs, but yeah, to, to just like look across the board and say, the bulk of your staff, uh, nearly all of your staff, you know, is, is unheard of. But again, to me, let's think about it this other way too. This is a credit to Joey as well. And, and not just because he's trying to take care of his people, but because his people want to stay here and work with him too, because yes. that, that, that point can't be overstated because I hear, I hear all the time in, 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 in circles, whether it be high school or college or whatever, the guy is miserable to work with, or I hate where I hate my job. I'm looking to get out of coaching because I have to work with this, this individual or whatever. And, and Joey is the opposite. He's the guy that they, they, they truly, cause he's not stupid. He, he gives them family time. 
he, you know, anyway, I just wanted to, I didn't want to rattle on, but I just want to make sure that we understand it's a, it's a cool thing too, because these guys want to stay here and they're not working till 3 a.m. They're not, you know, just, you know, being unproductive. They're, they're, you know, anyway, so I hope you get what I'm, I'm saying. A- absolutely. I would like, before we move on, to throw a, a wet blanket on this for just a moment. Let me play party pooper devil's advocate. But first, today's episode brought to you by America's number one sports book, FanDuel. And now's the perfect time to download FanDuel because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. So just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app right now. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. And you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores, three-pointers, whatever you got. If basketball is your thing, college hoops on and popping, midway point of the NBA season now in the rear view, and we're looking ahead to March Madness just around the corner. So get in with FanDuel today, download it right now, and get hooked up as a new customer with the No Sweat First Bet, up to $1,000. FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with that good old same game parlay. Mm. So don't miss the chance to get your No Sweat First Bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash Locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. I would like, before we move on, to throw a, a wet blanket on this for just a moment. Let me play party pooper devil's advocate. Okay. You went seven and five last year. You eight finished. Five. I'm sorry, eight and five. Yeah, <laughs> seven and five regular season, yeah, eight and you. five overall. Right. You finished okay. with four consecutive wins. Uh, obviously, that's that's what you want to do. You beat okay. opponents that that matter to your fan base in Texas and in Oklahoma. I I might ask the question, Chris, that without some of that kind of context, you're not having the same off season with just a general seven and five regular season record. If you're not beating Texas and Oklahoma, or if you do the Kingsbury thing and you're getting like six of those seven early, and then you're getting nothing in the last month, I don't know that we're having such a pep rally this off season. I. And again, I don't mean to be a party pooper, but I just think it's very interesting how freaking excited we've gotten about an eight and five season. And I think without the context of finishing really well, beating the big boys in the conference and then smacking an SEC team in a bowl game, I don't think we're doing this, at least quite to this extent. Am I wrong? There's a lot of emotion tied up in the achievements of last year. And I'm right there with every other Red Raider fan. But I just really think it's interesting what the season actually was and then how rah-rah we've gotten this offseason. Yeah, I like I I, th- I think there's a couple of ways you could play devil's advocate. There's there's your way, and then there, there's another one I'll get to in a second. But I I think though that you 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 do have that context and that there were some meaningful wins. There was wins you could sure. sink your teeth into, and, and there was a bunch strung in a row at the end, and that that is important to note. I think it also it is important to note you did all this with three different starting quarterbacks that that just can't be overlooked. And I think the other thing that factors in with, with Joey administration everywhere is how well you recruited, at least on paper. And I think that that is a sign of, OK, we, we, we've got, you know, this is how much importance they're placing on this part of the program. We, we, we pulled in a top 25, top 20 recruiting class, depending on where you looked. So this is this is worth investing in, but the other way to play devil's advocate is say say you're supposed to do uh, fairly well this season, which we we think you are. Uh, yeah. Say you're a, a fringe preseason top twenty five team, a, a fringe uh, you know pick to to play for the Big Twelve championship, whatever. However you want to phrase it, what if what if you don't do well? And you've, you know, what, what if, what if you, I don't think this will happen. I don't think there's any way this will happen, but what if you, what if you, what if it's the the opposite? What if you go five and seven and then you've got everybody locked into long-term deals? Then what are you saying? You know, are you going, yeah. this is a terrible day. Like we're stuck. Like we can't, <laughs> you know, but this so it's so a that, terrible day. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Like, like, <laughs> but, but th- that this is the business of college athletics right now. Yeah. This is just the way it works because, if you think you have something, you better bet on it 
because otherwise somebody is going to come scoop it up and then you're going to go try to find something that you hope and you know it's it's tricky to roll the dice and and hope when you kind of got a bird in the hand joey knows right chemistry and personalities and who's doing their job and all that because it's on him to to squeeze everything out of out of his guys that are working for him uh but you know that that's that's the the flip side too is that you cast your lot and then it doesn't go well and it's like uh oh <laughs> You know, so, so I mean, you, you're you're right. I mean, there's there's that part of it too, but it's just stability and culture is what wins in college athletics. I firmly believe it. And there's examples to the contrary. Don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying, uh, because there's first year coaches that come in and just like t- turn it immediately, you know. And there's there's all all these things, but or you you could maybe buy a team and, and have some success, whatever. But I'm just saying. More often than not, culture and then stability and keeping your people together, you know, and, and kind of having a window there. That's what that's what ultimately wins, especially so in football. I really just we get we get asked about it. We get comments on YouTube about it. That everybody is every Red Raider fan was kind of traumatized by the Kingsbury experience. So everyone wants to compare it immediately to that, Chris. And it's crazy to me that we're talking about. I think identical records, right? I mean, with Arizona State bowl win for Kingsbury, they wound up eight and five that year, I think. Yeah, I think and I'm and correct in that. No, you're you're dead on. The difference was is that it was seven and zero, oh, right? Then it, then it was a five game losing streak, oh, and, and then five, it was a yeah. and then it was a bowl win. This one was like the steady, but yeah. To to be fair, well, in the recruiting you talked about, I, yeah. I did not mention that, and I think that's yeah. so important that like yep. the the signs under the waters. You know, that maybe not everybody's paying that much attention to if you're just if you're just a football fan, you don't care about recruiting, whatever. I think that is the context, and I didn't even mention it when I was running down <laughs> the context of the season. I think maybe that is what really, really makes the difference in this very early moment uh, in the Joey McGuire uh, era here in West Texas. But you and I know, I mean, just like every other college football fan, and I don't think any era exemplified this more than the Mike Leach era in Lubbock. If you beat opponents that your fans care about, <laughs> seven and five can feel like nine and three. I mean, you know what I'm yeah. saying? We Facts. college football's yeah. world turns by beating opponents that your fans care about beating. Mike Leach worked the Aggies over and over and over and over. <laughs> and a seven and five or eight and four felt a hell of a lot better than that I mean, might suggest. Cowan Spike used to do this. He would lose to North Texas. But beat A and M, and it, it like it like almost in back to back weeks, and, and you're like, I don't know what to think, but God bless, we beat the Aggies, man. I mean, it's like you <laughs> right. know, and I, I remember living through those. This is kind of when I was in school uh, here. But to your point, I mean, this is a fact. You know, what, what what's going to change though? What's going to change, as we know, is that these meaningful games that were on your schedule that we've sitting here talking about winning, those are, those are no longer on your schedule in a couple of years and you only have really one of them next year. So it's yeah. going to be interesting to see how the fans handle what if, what if your meaty wins or, are the, the BYU's the central Florida's and the Kansas States of the world. Is that, does that carry as much water? I, I don't know. I mean, we, no. we, it, it, we just have to play it out, <laughs> but yeah. I, th- I think that that's that's interesting to kind of think about as we look into the future. So you may just look on paper and see first year records, um, and think you want and extensions and new contracts and hey, let's compare these eras. But I think as we've just outlined there, there are quite a few things going very differently uh, in that first year that has an identical record at the end of it as compared to what we had. Uh, well, a decade ago with Coach Kingsbury. But congratulations to those Red Raiders who are getting the bump and uh, can't wait to get back to it and actually have some football to discuss with spring football just around the corner. Football will be tied into the next conversation we're going to have, but impacting football and beyond. Let's take a look at the left coast as the Pac-12 has chose to engage in a stand-up comedy routine. It's going to be fun. Let's get to it next on Locked on Texas Tech. Thanks for joining us on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network with Chris Level. I'm Casey Cowan. Always great to be a part of your day coming at you from west of the 100th Meridian where it's really 
going down. And Chris, as we step away from Texas Tech, although Texas Tech could be impacted by these things in the near future, uh, we're talking Pac-12 conference and something that I just had to do not only a double take, but like a triple take at uh, as I was laughing hysterically reading this. You may have seen this joint statement from the 10 Pac-12 conference board members, which by the way, they screwed up even the release of this. This is fried successful media rights deals in the very near future. With multiple potential media rights partners over the past weeks, we remain highly confident in our future growth and success as a conference and united in our commitment to one another, end quote. Chris, which is exactly what you would say if you were on the precipice, precipice, f -f 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 I shouldn't have made fun of that guy there, that's what I get, precipice. <laughs> Of a great media rights deal for your league, right? This is exactly what you would say if that was just around the corner, man. This blew me away because this is as pitiful of a look, I think, as it gets. It's like somebody looking for a homecoming date and telling their buddy, well, I've had a lot of productive conversations this week, and I am looking forward to consummating a homecoming date very, very soon. Desperate, you know, so there, there's so much other things going on i'd love to be you know love to know what all was being discussed and talked about and you got to be really excited uh if you're an smu fan for these future oregon state smu amazon prime games be a lot of fun uh, i think to take yeah. in there i just th this is why i was so thrilled uh that whenever the utou exit came to be that nobody was really um, finding a bridge to the Pac-12 as far as the Big 12 was concerned. I thought it would be a foolish move. I think it went to show just how deeply rooted the narratives and, say, college football propaganda, I guess, actually was in that you had tech fans they are like, we got to go to the Pac-12. And it was only because they probably had no concept that so many in the Big 12, if not all, we're in a much more stable state pre-OU Texas departing and post-OU Texas departing than the Pac-12 members were. And you would only know that if you were, you know, had no life like me and you were looking into numbers every year like gate revenue and television ratings and you're just seeing, <laughs> dog, nobody cares in the Pac-12. Manhattan, Kansas is not Los Angeles. I get it. But people in Manhattan, Kansas care. For some reason, they show up. <laughs> so I, I never wanted any part of the Pac-12 conference whatsoever. I, I know that it was just at that point in time, probably a lot of Big 12 fans that were thinking, oh, my God, this entire thing is about to crumble to the ground. But it didn't, and it won't. But the Pac-12 will. Not a good look from them, and I can't wait to see what the next piece to fall into place uh, is actually going to be. But uh, that was just another indication, Chris, that this is going the way I think a lot of us expect it to go in that you will see some flailing, you'll see some weeping and gnashing of teeth <laughs> in their death throes. They're going off like a Cherokee to sing their death song in the forest or whatever <laughs> by themselves. And then you will see some migration uh, I think from the Pac-12 to the Big 12, I don't know what that collection of programs looks like, but I think it will happen at some point in time. And this is just another indication, in my opinion, uh, that that is going to be the case. Uh, Chris, before we get out of here, man, we have got to uh, make a hard left really quickly because our guy, Patrick Mahomes, is a Super Bowl champion once again. It was an incredible game, obviously, over the weekend. I'm sure many of you or all of you uh, took it in. And it was classic Patrick Mahomes, Chris. And it was another time where I'm kind of thinking – I'm not so sure that when Patrick gets a little dinged up and maybe has to kind of stay in the pocket a little more or maybe not get out there and do some of those things, I'm not sure he's not even a better quarterback at that point in time so, because obviously the dude still has the howitzer to sling it. Yeah, it's a fair, it's a fair point. Uh, I, I, th I think uh, here, here's some of the context with this with this player here that, that went to Texas Tech that I, I've heard people – talking about has he had these are the questions i've heard and, and this gives you an idea of just kind of how, how quickly this is just kind of blown up is he has he had the best start of any player in nfl history okay to a career to a career think about it 27 years old he's played five years he's been the super bowl three times already and won it twice he's been the mvp twice in just five years 
He's 27. Okay. I mean, this is, he just like, he just fast forward. I mean, he skipped, you know, to, I mean, you know, you think about it. There, there's people that play 15 years yeah. that don't have anywhere near th- this kind of, you know, career, multiple MVPs, three Super Bowl trips. And this, I mean, so 60, what is it? 60% of the time he's, he's, you know, finishing the game in the, in the last game. Uh, and then, uh, he, yeah. he won, he won it, uh, two out of three. Okay. And then one, the first, MVP uh, twice. first regular season MVP to be a Super Bowl MVP, I think since 99, yep. they said, okay. Kurt Warner was the last there one. you go. The, the other question feather heard, in the cap. <laughs> the other question I heard, I thought was interesting is that this isn't as impressive of a question to ask, but still the point still stands. Is he the best player to ever come from the big 12 conference? Not the big eight, not the big eight, but the best player to ever come from the big 12 conference. And you think about, you know, I mean, you know, wh- whether it was the early version of the Big Twelve or or the or the current or wh- whatever, um, and I mean, and just the fact that you're asking that tells you what this kid has accomplished um, at at the professional level. It, it's just it's all happened so fast. I think that people, I mean, odds are that you could you could suggest that Kansas City could be the favorite for the Super Bowl for the next. Five to ten years. I mean, that's not out of the you know. Something will change. Travis Kelsey right. at some point will retire. The pieces around him are going to change. Is there injuries? Can he stay healthy? Does Andy Reid change? I mean, all all those things, uh, you know, could, could get you know moved around and everything. But with him as the quarterback there, as long as there's competent, you know, pieces around him, I mean. They, they are going to be seen as the favorite until they're not. I mean, you know, and I don't know well, when. When think about the era we're in, the, the dude could play till he's 65. I mean, they've outlawed <laughs> defense. Uh, passers <laughs> have the entire field to work with. The middle's wide open. Nobody can take anybody's head off anymore. I mean, they've completely outlawed defense. And I think Patrick Mahomes could sit there because even when there is a point, like I was just saying a moment ago, where he's maybe not as able – to just make the wild on the move kind of plays, he's still going to stand upright in that quarterback, surrounded by a protective cocoon of NFL safety regulation, and he's going to sling it for 35 years. I don't know how long, but it's amazing <laughs> to think about the possibilities. And yeah, he may have, he's certainly in the conversation. I, I'd have to go back and, I don't know, see what Sammy Baugh did or something. Uh, he's certainly in the conversation of best starts to a professional career that there is ever been and if like dan marino was the previous example <laughs> i'm just trying to think of a guy who did something early on and then never went back by the and way never, yeah i was about to say that, that, was that was it water that was it comparison hey do you have anybody off the cuff that big 12 question is interesting who, who are the other entries off the cuff i'm trying to think who i would even put on that I, list as far I, I as who think, are great pros yeah that, that's i mean adrian peterson you know i think is somebody yeah. that i thought of because i think if, if you've never seen you know highlights of adrian peterson in oklahoma it was not a fair fight i mean he that is a grown <laughs> man and he had such a lengthy nfl career i i think it depends on probably how we're how we're judging it uh you yeah. know because i mean production and and all that because Adrian Peterson didn't he didn't win the championships and MVPs and all those things, but he was a great NFL player for a long time. Uh, but I don't know if he's anywhere near what Mahomes did. But I was trying to you know I, I don't know uh, who else to to offer up to you. But I think that the fact that you can ask that question and kind of even wonder about I mean think about it uh, because I mean even some of the Heisman Trophy winners I mean like the the Mayfields okay the um, who, who uh, Kyler Murray? I mean, you you, th- you think about who all has won Heisman trophies, like at Oklahoma or Ricky Williams. Even you know they they were the best players in college football. They came from the Big Twelve Conference, but nowhere near the impact on the NFL that Mahomes has had. I mean, not even close. So, I really thought that we may, and Adrian Peterson's a great answer. I really thought we may have to go defensive or in the trenches because there have been so many offensive guys in the Big Twelve that. Yeah you know, barely squeezed a drop in the National Football League, like you're just alluding to there. You think about guys like uh, you know, Vince Young or whatever, I don't know, uh, guys that just were a flash in the pan and, you know, then are, are working at errands or something, leasing out a dishwasher. I don't know. I just feel like 
Patrick Mahomes has got to be near the top of that list. And near the top of this list, I was a little surprised to see this, Chris, but we're damn sure going to mention it on Locked On Texas Tech. You see what it says up there, right? Locked On Texas Tech. And I think this was prior to the game. I may be mistaken, but I think this was prior to the game being played. Correct me if I'm wrong if you've seen this, but the Red Raiders, number six all time among college programs that have scored points in a Super Bowl. Did you see that list? I have not, no. Texas Tech, I believe this is before the game, was number six all time in points scored in a Super Bowl. I mean, you're going back to guys like Timmy Smith and beyond. I think uh, Donnie Anderson is on that list. Uh, and you've got some other, I think Bam Morris is on that list. He scored against the Cowboys, I think, in that Super Bowl. But point being, you ain't finding the Aggies there. You ain't finding the Longhorns there. I was surprised to see that. The Texas Tech had such a good showing. I think they're number six on that list. And now Patrick Mahomes obviously added to that quite a bit. Uh, All-time points scored uh, as represented by a college program. West I think number Wilkers, one was Miami. Wes Wilkers helped you there. Uh, yeah. It's kind of funny because Miami and Florida, if I'm not mistaken, were either two of the top three or two of the top four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thank, you, thank you, State of Florida, for our Super Bowl production. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yes, that is pretty but that good. That's pretty amazing. I thought for Texas Tech all-time, you would probably not guess that. Uh, but, yeah, when you're looking among those in the great state or you're looking among those in the Big 12 or otherwise, uh, the Red Raiders at or near the top of the list as far as point production uh, in the Super Bowl throughout uh, the history of the event. Congratulations to Patrick. Saw him at uh, Disney World or Land or whatever, uh, taking it all again. It's just old hat for him now, right? He's going to be like, I, I, I don't know. I need Universal Studios this time or something, guys. I've already been to Disneyland 15 times. This is my 16th Super Bowl. I gotta go somewhere else. Make make it six flags or whatever. Yeah, well, and then the next uh, the the next <laughs> the next challenge for him is be, is is to win it again because or soon, and 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 that that will be difficult as it always is. But that that's what will make them a quote unquote dynasty. I don't think you can be called a, a dynasty of sorts unless you put a third one together. You know, a couple. Uh, that's been done before, uh, but but when I think you have the three in in a, in a short span, that's when it it becomes dynasty. So that's kind of their next challenge or his next challenge. And I think trying to, you know, I mean, you know, and again, the MVPs will be be great and all those things. But really, it's just about him staying healthy. Um, by the way, the other player that I thought about, uh, we you know, was in Damakong Sioux, okay, which was yep, a that's a good you know a, a a really good. Uh, you know, I think a rare type uh, player that I thought in some ways was better in college than he's been in the NFL, although he's still wreaking havoc in the NFL uh, and, and is bounced around with some different teams. But he, he was, a you know, kind of a generational type guy yeah. a little bit, uh, I think, on that Nasty defensive line position. Nasty man. He sure was. He, he, <laughs> Nasty sumbuck. He would. He would spit on you, punch you, whatever it took. Yeah, yeah. So And he was there Sunday, right? He's an eagle now, I think. I believe that's right. They signed him uh, that he was early, in the mix. early in the season. That's right. Um, here's the list. Miami number one, Florida number two. Like, this was prior to the game. I think Texas Tech is now actually top five. Penn State three. The Cal Golden Bears <laughs> number four. And then you've got Notre Dame at number five. Texas Tech at number six was the way it stood uh, prior to the ball game. So pretty interesting to note. And, of course, there are Red Raiders on both sidelines. Uh, in the Super Bowl on Sunday. But uh, thankfully, the one in the uniform that I could stomach seeing win was the one that actually won, with all due respect to those Red Raiders and that god-awful shade of green. What are you <laughs> thinking, Philadelphia? What are you thinking? You're not. That's what you're doing. All right, appreciate you guys for hanging with us, as always, on Locked On at Texas Tech. We're back here on the other side, and we'll begin setting our sights on hoops again as we get closer to the weekend and the Red Raiders hit the road. Don't look now. Texas Tech is on some NCAA tournament lists. Not in, but bubble conversations. They're happening. They're happening. And Chris, I just saw yesterday that Tech currently has got more quad one wins than like three or four that are in right now. I think USC was on that list, North Carolina. I mean, it's just crazy what you can do if you have any success in the Big 12 Conference because of the opportunity it provides. And Tech has still got plenty of that so stay tuned the conversation is not over just yet chris thanks for the time today as always man appreciate the perspectives and insight absolutely man keep hope alive we'll talk to you tomorrow
You got it. Thanks for making us your first listen, and we hope you'll make Locked On College Basketball your second listen right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, available on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. For Chris, I'm Casey. Have a great one. We'll see you on the other side on Locked On Texas Tech.